and we're now going into gas turbines for propulsion systems. So propulsion systems, so this is the prime, especially for aircraft, aircraft propulsion systems. How does a gas turbine work? How does it work? So what is this big heavy thing that's strapped underneath the wing of these aircraft that you fly around in, commercial uh, aircraft especially? How do they work? Well, they have essentially a Brayton cycle, but they don't produce power, they produce thrust. They make a, they, they, they generate a force on the bottom of that wing to move the aircraft down the runway and then up and continue to go into the sky. So its, it's purpose is to not produce work, but to, to produce thrust. Let's take a look at the insides before we talk about linear momentum and thrust. So we have air is ingested, okay? And it comes in with some speed, but it's usually very small. It goes through the system, and what happens to the air? It comes out at the exhaust, and it's very fast. The exit speed needs to be much, much greater than the inlet speed. That's the goal of the engine. Okay, well, take a look at how it does it. First, it runs it through a compressor, and you can see the cross-sectional area here getting smaller because it's getting more and more dense. There's a bunch of compressor stages in between them. There's basically, they're rotating, so rotors and then stators to re-straighten the flow. So when, when you take fluids, a lot of times it's like, why are we studying flow when it hits and is deflected, you know, off of a, a deflector, a vein, basically. Well, that's why. It's, it's a very um, common uh, occurrence in compressors and as well as in turbines. Then it comes into a, a part where they often have multiple canisters for combustors, and they'll have them around the, the, the uh, periphery in the middle of the jet engine. And that's to be able to control the flame and not be put out when you're going very fast and have a good combustion. And then it mixes with some cooler air, and then it goes at the highest temperature that the materials can withstand it goes into the rotating turbine section. So it extracts, the turbine extracts some energy out of that flowing fluid, but it only extracts enough to drive the compressor. Now, if this shaft would have been hooked up to a prop, turbo prop, yeah, then you have to drive the compressor plus provide work to drive the propeller. Or if it had been hooked up to a fan, a fan, then it has to provide enough work to drive the compressor and the fan. Or, this is not aircraft propulsion, but like a helicopter, it would be hooked up to a shaft with the propeller. Okay, then, then, um, then you need that mechanical workout. But for aircraft propulsion, you just have, for the basic jet engine, just extract enough work out of the working fluid to run the compressor. This pressure right here is still fairly high, pretty high, and the temperature is very high. You put it through a nozzle to help shoot it out to give it the maximum speed. So why is the maximum speed needed for um, generating a large amount of thrust? Well, um, you have the concept of linear momentum in your dynamics class, true? Maybe use the symbol L for linear momentum. For a particle, what is the linear momentum? MV. Mass times speed. If I had a baseball, basketball, it's in the air, you say, what's its linear momentum? A car going down the road, what's its linear momentum? It's the product of the mass of the object and its speed, true? If you have a whole bunch coming out, you have a mass flow rate times its exit speed. The mass flow rate times its exit speed. Okay. Um, there's a couple ways to do the quick derivation, but um, uh, what is this equation? F equals ma. Newton's law of motion. True. Sometimes you'll see it like this. You ever see it like that? 
And that's really the time rate of change of the linear momentum of the object. But now we have a system where you have flow in one side and out the other side, and it's coming in this control volume with a low linear momentum flow rate. Its linear momentum flow rate is the product of the mass flow rate times the velocity in, and it goes out with a high. The m dots really don't change. It's the, a higher linear momentum flow rate because of the exit speed is so much higher than inlet speed. Yes, there's a little bit of fuel added, but that's negligible, the mass of the fuel. It's, it's really not what makes it work. So, so the thrust, the F, the imbalance on the force, is equal to the linear momentum flow rate exiting minus the inlet. Okay? So... Um, so the uh, it's like the system the uh, has a force on the air in that direction to push it out to increase its linear momentum flow rate. Well, if the system has the force on the air going out that way, there's something that has to hold it, and it's the bottom of the wing, and the bottom of the wing then feels a forward thrust or a forward force of equal magnitude but in opposite direction. So you feel that forward thrust, so I'm not really worried about the sign right here. The aircraft, if it's throwing it out at the, at the back end very fast, it wants to move something and generate a net forward thrust on the body of the aircraft, the bottom of the wing. Okay, and there you go. And this is incredible. Um, uh, an en highly engineered device that uh, rapidly was, was, was brought into production at the end of World War II, and now is, it's, it's all over. Jet engines are all over. Gas turbines are all over. And is it the domain of the civil engineers? No. Is it the domain of the petroleum engineers, the chemical engineers? No. It's the domain of the mechanical engineers. It's our domain, just like internal combustion engines. And uh, in San Antonio, we have some re engine refurbishing going on, and some students have gone on to work for companies that specialize in that. But I've known some students graduate, and they go, and they work for GE out of state. They go somewhere else to work for them in the design, or Pratt & Whitney in the design. But those are pretty aggressive students who know what they want to do. I want to work on jet engines. That's what excites me. But there are some local industries uh, in, in that uh, who are more of refurbishing or maintaining those engines. I encourage you to take a look if you haven't been exposed to them at some YouTube videos. There's a number of them. I didn't just picked one. It's, you know, just what are these jet engines? And they have some nice videos of aircraft flying and doing all sorts of maneuvers, which stress how, how much thrust they can generate, what power they can generate. It's incredible. And they talk about different styles of the engine, the turboprop, so you have a propeller, the turbofan, very, very common for commercial aviation, et cetera. Okay, the different styles of the engines. This is only Thermo 2. We just give you the basics of analyzing just a, a standard um, turbo jet engine. Turbojet engine. That's it. Without the complexity of the fan and the or the com or the compressor or the uh, propeller. So here is how we analyze it. So we have already been introduced to the compressor, combustor, and the turbine. Those you're familiar with, you've analyzed those for stationary gas turbines that turn a shaft to make electricity, and there's a lot of that going on in the industry. But we have in the front a diffuser section, that's new, and a nozzle in the back. So what, does the, what is the purpose of the diffuser? It's really slow it down so it can be ingested through the engine, because sometimes the aircraft is moving very fast through air. So you have a little bit of a diffuser section. Now they rename or introduce state A instead of state zero or starting with one, two, three. They wanted to leave in the front of the compressor state one, then two, and then three, and then four. Those are 
our numbering system already introduced, so they want to not change that. But they introduce state A, which is a little awkward because it's a letter instead of a number, and state B, which is a little awkward. Sometimes I'll call this state 5. All right, so exit after the nozzle. So um, let's ask a couple of questions. You have some pressure of the air specified at A, inlet, some temperature of the A inlet, and some velocity of the A inlet. That velocity is the, it, 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 you can calculate its kinetic energy at A. What is that? One half VA squared. And it could be non negligible. But what the diffuser is going to do is slow it down. It'll still have some speed, but the kinetic energy will be negligible at state one, two, three, and four. The only states where the kinetic energy is not negligible is A and B. A and B. The rest of the time, the kinetic energy is negligible at the other states, okay? Right. So here it is. You're going to bring it in the diffuser, and you're going to slow it down. You're not going to bring it all the way to rest, but you're going to bring it such that the kinetic energy is negligible. It's still moving, but it's slower, much slower uh, speed. So uh, what happens to the uh, pressure? Does it go up? Is P1 greater than PA? Is it the same? How about the temperature at 1? Does it go up? Does it go down? Is it the same as TA? And we already talked about V1 is approximately zero or negligible, and Ke1 is zero, approximately zero. Okay. And how do I answer that question? How do I determine with confidence the relationship between Pa and P1 and Ta and T1? Okay. And the pressure goes up, but why? I'm a skeptic because the velocity drops. Okay, but why? Got to conserve. Gotta conserve what? Momentum. Bernoulli's equation, yes, from fluid mechanics. Bernoulli's equation is the longest streamline. True. And there's a number of assumptions. Incompressible. Incompressible. Is below 0.3 Mach. It could be up in that vicinity, though, where we'll talk about compressible effects later. But as a beginning introduction, yes. So that would be an assumption. Watch out if you go above 0.3 Mach, 0.5, your, your bets are off. Don't use Bernoulli or modify the Bernoulli to account for the compressible effects. Just like you modify Bernoulli for viscous effects, because otherwise, Bernoulli truly is for inviscid flow along a streamlined steady state, blah, blah, blah. True? Okay, incompressible. But what I was thinking that you might say is, let's do a analysis. What's that dashed line indicate? Control volume. And I can do, coming out of thermo, well, there's three at least, the, the basics. What type of balance? What type of balance? What type of balance? Mass, energy, entropy. First and second law for sure. Mass is done. It's m dot in is equal to m dot out. It's operating at steady state. How much work? How much heat transfer across the boundary of that diffuser? None, none. Negligible changes in potential energy. So all we have is coming in from the energy balance, the inlet enthalpy plus the inlet kinetic energy at A, sorry, is equal to the enthalpy at 1. What happened to the kinetic energy at 1? It's negligible. True? Well, what insight does that help me see? Well, do this. If I have some kinetic energy at A and I assume constant specific heats, uh, can you see why? What is the relationship between T1 and TA? So I rearrange this equation and I'll have C sub P T1 minus TA is equal to KEA. True. The kinetic energy of A coming in is positive. So what happens to the temperature at 1 compared to the temperature at A? 
It has to be greater. It has to be greater. True? Now, so we know that the temperature of 1 is greater than the temperature of A. The te it heated up. It's a higher temperature. What about the pressure? Pardon? The pressure? The pressure will increase by how much? couple ways to get it. One is if you just stay in your thermodynamic state of mind. What is constant through the diffuser if you assume it's reversible? There's no irreversibility. Hey, that's Bernoulli's, isn't it? Indicit. Yes, it is. So it's, it's, it's entropy is constant. S is equal to constant. True? And then you recall there's a number of relationships. If I have a gas and I have a process between states then I can relate changes in temperature and changes in volume and changes in pressure through a simple analytic expression for constant specific heats. So the equation that you may have in the equation sheet would be something like uh, T2 divided by T1 is equal to P2 over P1 to the power K minus 1 over K. Ideal gas isentropic process between states 1 and 2. Constant specific heat, Those, that's the three things. True? So now we adapt it to this problem where I have uh, maybe I call this state A, pressure A, state 1, state 1. See that? So the pressure at state 1 could be expressed as the pressure at 2 times the temperature at A, uh, let's do it this way, no, not this one, it's, sorry, pressure at A times T1 over TA to the power K over K minus 1. Little algebra, go from here to there, true? How many people like that? There you go. So now you look at it and you say, well, this, this exponent is a non-zero positive exponent. We can just put in the number, 1.4 divided by 0.4, whatever it gives. True? 1.4 divided by 0.4. What about T1 over TA? Is this ratio greater than 1 or less than 1? It's greater than 1. So something greater than 1 to an exponent. You're going to get greater than 1. This whole thing right here is greater than 1. So what happened to the pressure 1? It's greater than PA by that factor. That's how you would actually calculate it. So now we hit this state 1. You've, you've calculated maybe P1 and uh, T1. And you give, you're typically given a pressure ratio, P2 over P1 for the compressor. OK? So then you march across and you can get the, if you have some isotropic efficiency for the compressor, you can work, consider isotropic, adjust for the work. Do, we've done that. True? You have to still be able to do that calc. Typically in the problem, T max is given. That's 1,500 Kelvin, 2,000 Kelvin, 1,800 Kelvin, whatever it is. It's better for performance if that temperature goes up. Just like it's better for performance if the pressure ratio goes up. Then we go through the turbine. We've done analysis with expansion through the turbine. The only question is, is let's say this pressure ratio is 10 for the compressor. Does it mean that P3 divided by P4 is 10? This is a tricky question. Let me ask this question. If I would like to kick this out through the nozzle very fast, back up to the nozzle, think about the nozzle first. Think about, just like we did for the diffuser, think about the pressure at 4 and the pressure at B, the exit. The temperature at 4 and the temperature at B, the exit. And the velocity at 4 and the velocity at the exit B, 
and the kinetic energy at 4 and the kinetic energy at the exit B. True? We already said that it's negligible, negligible. True? You suspect that if you really want a large V out, that, that, that this from the first law is going to be H. I'm not, I didn't leave enough room because of this thing sitting here. 4 minus HB from the first law. True? Just like we did the first law for the diffuser, the kinetic energy at the exit B is H4. So we would like a large difference. We, our goal is to get a large difference between, let me try and wrap this over here. But if I had constant specific heats, C sub P T4 minus TB. I would like T4 to be hot and TB to be cold. And then I'll have a large kinetic energy exiting that nozzle. True? True. So how do I, this nozzle is going to be just like the diffuser, isentropic. True. So if I want this 4 to be a lot greater than B, to have a high kinetic energy going out, a high speed, what do you think about P4? Does this same equation up here apply? Sure does. You just have to glean the insight into the equation. The best thing you can do is make P4 as great as possible over PB. It'll really push out the gases through the nozzle, and you'll have a highest kinetic energy and the highest speed, the highest thrust. Okay. So... Um, so I don't want this to go down the 10. This is not going to go all the way down. Well, how far does it go? How far does it go? It's got to come down in pressure. The pressure at 4 is going to be between the pressure at 3 and definitely the pressure at B. You would like the pressure at 4 to be as close to pressure at 3 as possible. How do you determine the pressure at 4? Pressure at 4 is not given. It has to fall out in the analysis. How do you calculate it? Exactly. The turbine makes just enough work to run the compressor, and that's the key. That's what ties it together. So you figure out, even accounting for the isentropic efficiency of the compressor, what is the compressor work that's actually needed? then you know that has to be exactly equal to what the turbine actually produces. If you're given some efficiency of the turbine, then you have to back up and calculate the work isentropic for the turbine. And the work isentropic of the turbine is related to the pressure change as well as temperature change between 3 and 4. Yes, sir? So you're saying we find, like, we use the, the words to find the H4? Yes. So if we get H4, do we assume that, that that H4 is falling somewhere in the saturated, saturated zone? Or what if it's, a it's, all, it's all air. Oh, this is air. all air, yeah. Gas power cycles. Yeah. So you can do it with constant specific heats like this, or you can use the air tables counting for variable specific heats. So Let's see if I can um, work through maybe a couple of these equations. T3 is typically specified given, true? Max temperature. And you calculate the work that the compressor needs. So now you know that the work of the turbine is equal to the work of the compressor. And the work of the turbine is going to be H3 minus H4, true? Constant specific heat, C sub P, T3 minus T4, true? So really, I've calculated T4. T4, okay? Um, if you wanted to, you could then do this. Uh, this is the work of the turbine. What is the, if I do have some isentropic efficiency of the turbine, the work of the turbine isentropic is going to be 1 over the efficiency of the turbine times the work of the turbine actual. Do you like that equation? Do you like that? So this right here is T4 actual. Okay. 
So what we find is we have C sub P, T3 minus T4 isentropic equal to C sub P, T3 minus T4 actual divided by the efficiency of the turbine. You use that to get T4 isentropic. Once you have T4 isentropic, then you can use this type of equation right here. I'll write it out. It would be that pressure at 4 compared to the pressure at 3 is equal to the, um, the temperature at 4s divided by the temperature at 3 because this equation only works. S is equal to a constant, right? Isentropic process, that analytic expression, to the power K over K minus 1. That's how you calculate P4. Maybe it helps to draw it on a temperature entropy diagram. Here's a line of constant pressure, and that's the pressure at A. I forgot to ask that question. Is the pressure at B equal to the pressure at A? You have this engine. It's ingesting right here, and it's throwing out right there. Is the pressure at the exit equal to the pressure at the inlet for a real jet engine? That's a tough question. How about this? Only those who have passed fluid mechanics can answer this question. All those that have passed fluid mechanics, please raise your hand. The only one brave soul. All right, we'll expand the pool so it's not just one brave soul. It'll be all of those who are currently enrolled in fluid mechanics can answer this question. All right. So what do you think? So in fluid mechanics, they have a thing about, oh, if I have streamlines, fluid is going through a pipe and it's bent. And I have the instantaneous radius. Just think about the average radius for all the streamlines. Then I can tell the difference in the pressure from here to here. Let's say from 1 to 2. Okay, those in fluids, you have flow. It's curving, going around inside a pipe, inside the walls of a duct, a slot, or whatever. It's flowing this direction. Those are the streamlines. Is the pressure at 1 equal to the pressure at 2? Is the pressure at 1 greater than the pressure at 2? Is the pressure at 1 less than the pressure at 2? Which is it? I'm going to pause, and then we're going to figure this one out, because if we can answer that, then all we do is take those streamlines and bend them such that they're straight. Does that jog anybody's memory? So, okay. All right. Figured this out a long time ago. And there's Euler's equations to describe flow around curves, streamlines, and bends. The pressure at 2 is greater. The pressure at 2 is greater than the pressure at 1. What happens if the streamlines straighten out? So the instantaneous radius of curvature goes off to infinity. Then what's the change in the pressure going across? When, when the fluid, lines, fluid streamlines are going that way, right? So even though it's issuing from the back of an engine, and they come out like that, what is the difference in pressure between the air out here, the air, 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 all the way across? Pressure is same, equal. That's right. The pressure is equal. So let's get back to our discussion. So the pressure at B is equal to the pressure at A. Even though when you look at it, you probably are thinking, hmm, I'm going to use my hand to sense the pressure there, right? And I'll take my hand and I'll put my hand right up here, like in the back of the engine. Guess what? You disturb the flow. It piled up all the air right there that's trying to go out at so many meters per second high speed and it's like sticking your hand out the car window it's going to get ripped off you know but now you've changed the flow you're not you're using the wrong instrument to measure pressure so if you're conceptually thinking hmm put my hand up there no your hand is going to feel a large force kicking it back 
But the pressure here and the pressure here and the pressure here are all the same. Uh, basically, you don't even have to. The theory confirms it. It's like it's the same pressure. But if you had to measure it, you could come in here with a very slender needle-like probe right there. And the probe is called a pitot tube. Heard of that word? That's what you would do. And it would go long and slender, and then it would bend eventually. Down here, it is going to disturb the flow because you bent it. But the itty bitty little needle pointing into the flow and the flow coming along disturbs it minimally. And it has little ports on the very tip and little ports around the periphery of that near the tip. And it measures two pressures. Hoots. Come on now. This is, this is the eat it up domain of mechanical engineers. This is a do not pass go without collecting your $200. This is the must-have knowledge. Anybody know how the PO tube works? Stagnation pressure. Static pressure. The static. So you bring it to rest at the tip of the pitot tube, so it measures the velocity plus the static pressure, sometimes called the dynamic pressure plus the static pressure, and the ports around the side. If it's cut slowly and you don't have a big wake or, or separation region, that measures the static pressure in the pro. In the, and that's what we're talking about. That's the static pressure. Okay. Good little review. It took too much time, though, but we press forward. Uh, temperature entropy diagram, you jump up in pressure, and this was the pressure at 1 from the pressure at A, the pressure at B. Okay. It was straight up on a TS diagram. Now, if you go through the compressor, you're going to go from 1 up to a higher pressure. This is the pressure at 2, which is the pressure at 3. That's the pressure of the combustor. You would go from 1 to 2. If you had some irreversibilities, you would go up to 2S and then kick it over to 2, right, because of irreversibilities on a TS diagram? Given that the pressure ratio is specified, it would go from P1 to P2. Then you heat it up, going up, 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 up to 3. And at 3, you decide to expand it. But this is where you go to an intermediate pressure, that pressure at 4, which is hopefully a lot greater than the pressure at 1, because then it'll really drive the flow through the nozzle and have a high exit speed. So you would go down to... 4s, and then if it's irreversible, it kicks it over to 4. And then we model the nozzle as isentropic, and it really comes down a lot. So this large temperature change, you can think constant specific heats, multiplied by the specific heat, large temperature change multiplied by specific heat, gives a large kinetic energy on the outlet, hence a large linear Momentum, linear momentum flow rate, a large thrust. That makes sense? Very good. Well, let's walk through a problem. Let's walk through this problem. So we have air enters the turbojet at 35 kPa and 270 Kelvin. Is that high pressure, low pressure? What is that pressure? It's what? It's low. And basically, the aircraft is at high altitude. And so at high altitudes, it's not atmospheric pressure. At sea level, it's lower pressure. What about the temperature? Cold, high altitude. <laughs> OK. Um, and then it's flowing at an inlet velocity of 70 meters per second coming into the diffuser. The mass flow rate, 20 kilograms per second is given. The air is slowed in the diffuser such that you neglect then the kinetic energy at states 1, 2, 3, and 4. The pressure ratio across the compressor is 11. Is the pressure ratio across the turbine 11? We just talked about that. It's hopefully a lot less so that it drives the flow through the nozzle to get a high exit speed. The turbine inlet temperature is 1450. The work developed by the turbine equals the compressor work input. They didn't have to say that, did they? If it doesn't equal it, it's not going to work. 
right? Okay. The isotropic efficiency of the compressor is 80 and 75% for the turbine. The diffuser and the nozzle, these are common assumptions, are isentropic. So two components are isentropic, nozzle and diffuser, to have some efficiency associated with it. There's negligible pressure drop through the combustor. The operation steady state, kinetic energy is negligible except at the inlet and the exit of the engine. Assume constant specific heats with this value of C sub P and that value of K and now determine the velocity at the nozzle exit. Wouldn't that be VB? And then what is the thrust developed by the engine? The forward thrust is that equal to the mass flow rate, which is 20 kilograms per second times the velocity at the exit minus the velocity at the inlet, and that is V sub A right there. So if I get the answer to part A, then it's straightforward to get the answer to part B. Do these units really work? What, what, what do I expect for the units on thrust in SI? How about a newton? Is a newton? Is that what we want? A newton? And this is a kilogram per second. And what are the meters per second? Does that work? I can't write today. Meters per second? Kilogram meter per second squared. Is that a newton? Sure is. Units do work. Very good. Well, oh boy, I'm out of time. So let me do this. Let me show you. Here's the solution. And uh, um, I set it up in Excel, and all you do is walk through the equations and continue to solve. So these are inputs. The kinetic energy is small on the inlet, and you calculate from 1 to 2. How do I go from 1 to 2? That was that equation for isentropic process, right? Right? Where you have... Well, actually, it's um, it's not it's just the energy balance. C sub p, T1 minus T a is equal to the kinetic energy at a, energy balance. Once I have that, then I march over and get the pressure there. I'm just going to be using the equations that we just had outlined, especially like this equation. All right. Well, I see I'm out of time, so I'm not going to be able to do this problem justice. These numbers all work, and I encourage you to go ahead and solve this problem. You'll find that the exit speed is 800 and about 40 meters per second using this cold air standard analysis. Uh, thank you for your attention.